So I'll actually start just while, while we're starting, until my slides come up. Um, just so everyone, just to introduce myself, my name is Brett Dalton. I am Head of Educational Services at Moodle HQ. So I'll talk about where my role sits in with everyone else uh, in the organisation. Um, so quick introduction for me. I started in the education sector probably about 15 plus years ago. I started at La Trobe University. Um, actually working in the drama department there and then later I worked in the educational resources area actually developing educational resources for academics, eventually running the lecture capture system there. Since then I've worked for Echo360 which is a lecture capture system some of you might be familiar with. Um, I worked for Instructure for quite a few years uh, as a senior, senior solution architect. So if anyone's not familiar with Instructure they sell Canvas, LMS, they're one of the major competitors for Moodle. Big part of my role there was actually being across what Moodle's capabilities were, what Blackboard's capabilities were, what uh, D2Ls. I also was involved with a lot of implementations and a lot of architectural um, integration decisions helping out, uh, helping out those clients. Uh, from there I worked at Melbourne University for a short period actually helping them implement an LMS uh, migration and a VMS, so Kaltura, there. And uh, my last role was at ReadyTech. So I was head of, uh, head, head, of, head of technology at ReadyTech um, and I was looking after three student management system products. So I was product managing and engineering manager for all of that. Um, and now I'm head of uh, middle education, that's head, yeah. I'm doing well. So <laughs> head of educational solutions at um, Moodle. So just a little bit more about me. I like to build things, so I love learning how new skills, I love learning new things, so education and learning is a really big passion of mine. Um, these are all the things that I've done over many years, so I used to sew. Um, my daughters, my lovely daughters, came to me right the day before school um, and said, hey, we've got a superhero thing tomorrow, can you sew me some costumes? And so that was done overnight with no patterns. I used to cross stitch, I built myself a trailer over COVID to keep myself sane. I did professional photography for quite a few years. Um, ask me about the axe. I went on an axe making course last week. I do knife making and blacksmithing. It's just one of the many skills I like to learn. And it's one of the reasons I love learning. It keeps me engaged, it keeps me sane. It's really good for my mental health. I, it's one of the reasons why I'm passionate about education for you know, pretty much the rest of the world as well. Because it's one of those things that actually has many more benefits other than just, hey, I learn a skill, I do a job. So where do I sit within the Moodle HQ? So I look after the educational solutions teams. Uh, Matt Porritt, who's speaking later today, he's the head of platform. So really the split there is I look after everything that's student academic facing. He looks after the platform itself and the back end. There is a lot of overlap between our responsibilities. So we work very, very closely together. We both report to Murray. Um, I also look after the Moodle Cloud team. So the SaaS solution that we, we provide for the smaller customers. So actually on to the main part of the presentation. What I want to start with is Moodle's mission. So that's empowering, educa empowering educators to improve the world. And really one of the things about that is what I want to talk about open source and really open source has actually allowed us to get I'll do a lot in that space. So just a quote from Martin. Uh, we believe that truly open source projects such as Moodle supporting education systems are the best way to distribute innovation globally and help the education sector create a better educated, more connected human population for this planet. We saw him talk about this during the keynote. So the open source nature of Moodle is never going to change. It is absolutely key to what we've been able to achieve to date. But if you look at that philosophy, you know, we've got over 2,000 entries in our plugins directory. We have hundreds of millions of installs, sorry, hundreds of millions of users, hundreds of thousands of installs worldwide. Um, but being open source comes with a cost. That cost is actually a high entry, a barrier to entry for a lot of people. So if I am a teacher running a very small organisation, might be a professional training organisation, it might be a charitable thing, it might be a community group, I don't necessarily have the coding abilities, I don't necessarily have the knowledge, I don't know Linux, I don't know Windows, I don't have all those skills that a lot of people in this room have or have teams of people to do to be able to access that. Yes. So Tim's, Tim's question was, have I been on the, uh, on the receiving end of a large closed source package? So 
when I worked at La Trobe, I actually worked on, I actually implemented a couple, um, including Echo 360 and some other software as well. Um, I worked with, worked with WebCT and was part of the, uh, part of the um, assessment team that actually went through to do, um, would actually eventually select Moodle. So. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to, actually, a lot, if we can leave more questions to the end, because it's got quite a lot to go through. But yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. So I think the difference there is that a lot of people, he was just saying that he hasn't had the same experience as what I'm talking about here. And that's one of the key points, is that Moodle is, has a very, very broad user base, incredibly broad user base. So we're talking from large institutions in Europe to, you know, even institutions in Europe are very different to institutions in Australia and the US and Asia. So there's a broad, broad experience of people, broad experience, um, and a large proportion of our user base is actually quite small. So is open source enough to achieve those, those goals of being able to empower our teachers and our students at the end point? And I would say that it has been key to the success so far, but in and of itself is not enough. And that's really what we want to be striving towards. So to really talk about how that, you know, why that might be, let's look at a couple of the trends within the edtech industry. Some of these things have been developing over the last 10 years. Some of these are quite quick, have been very short, or are actually accelerating more. So the LMS is becoming more modular because of the varying demands of the users. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, where you've got, I have a teacher, and I have no technical team, and I have 20 students. But I have OUA, which has got, you know, I think, I don't, I can't remember how many students, it's 70,000, 100,000 students. 200,000 students, there we go. Big team, dedicated resources to work on these things, very, very different requirements. The number of teaching tools are coming out. We saw this in Martin's keynote. He was looking at the tools in some of the other spaces, but in the education sector, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing tools rapidly come out. We're seeing improvements to existing tools. If we look at some of our partners around, uh, H5P is releasing an AI type stuff. I know that Turnitin's working on those sort of things. We, he's, we have these tools coming out literally weekly at the moment. Teaching methodology is changing rapidly, and we saw a really fast change over COVID around that. So that is actually very hard for a large platform like Moodle to be able to catch up. Um, I think in the last three years, the way people have been teaching, the way people have been thinking about teaching has changed very, very rapidly. Students are becoming increasingly mobile, and this is part of that lifelong learner trend that we were talking about, or I was talking about personally, where people go and do a degree. And the tradition was you go and do a degree, you go and get a job. Now it is, I go and do a degree, I go and do a refresher course, I might need to go and do this certificate over here because I find it interesting. Actually, I want to go to an axe making, axe making course over here because it's just cool. And we get a lot more of that sort of migration between education providers. And we're seeing that not just within one country or one region, but internationally as well. Um, with the more globally connected markets, more globally connected, you know, internet, travel, everything, it's easy for students to do that. Um, and as a result, people are increasingly looking for an LMS that does the LMS piece really well and not everything. So 20 years ago, 10 years ago, people were looking, oh, I need to have this piece of functionality, if this piece of functionality, I need to have this. They're increasingly looking at them as a platform. And we can see this if we look at like the other three major LMSs out there, the rhetoric they're using in their advertising. Now, they have a vested interest in saying, hey, we also do a badging platform, we also do an analytics platform. So they have a vested interest in that. But that, this is a response to the market, this is a response to the users, this is a response to the institution saying, we actually want something that's easy to connect to other tools. So taking that forward, what makes a platform? So you know, we're now talking about a learning platform as opposed to a learning management system. So lowering that barrier to innovation. How do we make it easier to connect those other tools in? Interoperability, so how do we know that my tool is going to work with this tool, it's going to work with that tool, and I don't have to do a whole bunch of custom code to make it all hang together. Standardizing the data model, so this is about the learner portability. When I want to, as a learner, I want to, I started at RMIT, and I want to go do some work at Melbourne University, or I want to go do a small certificate over here, how do I take that credential with me without having to go try to copy pieces of paper, shuffle that around, somebody has to trust that the piece of paper I have is actually the real thing. And privacy and security. 
for your teachers, if they are to be able to actually install those tools and use those tools, whatever system we're using, that privacy and security has to be A, non-technical, and B, by default. So those sort of things should be built into the way that we actually think about them from, from the start. So using a Lego analogy, if you have the right platform and the right tools, anyone can become a master builder. So if anyone's seen the Lego movie and knows that analogy, you know, it means that you, know, you don't have to have that deep technical knowledge, you don't have to have all those skills to be able to actually achieve a really cool outcome. So how do we move towards this? How do you move more towards, towards a more seamless integrated learning ecosystem? Standards. And this is one of my favorite XKCDs of all time. You know, we have 14 standards, that's ridiculous. We need one more universal standard. Shortly later, we have 15 standards. And that's a good way to think about it because that's what we see in every industry. That's what we see in every, every industry. So really, when you start thinking about it, I'm showing my age here, VHS versus beta. Does anyone remember the um, VHS wars where you had two major standards, USB, and lightning connectors. Now, this gets back to some of the things that I wish everyone could have been in the, in the UX jam yesterday. They, we covered some really amazing stuff. Zoe's team was just spot on. When people think about the needs, people go, oh, I have a connector, so the need for my user is to charge their phone. No, that's not their need. Like, that's what they will do, but that's not their need. The connector analogy is, I have a phone. I want to be able to travel anywhere and know that I'll be able to charge my phone. That's their need. So that's where the standardization of those sort of standards comes in very, very powerful. I don't know whether anyone remembers back in the days when, you know, before we had 3G and we had the Nokia's and we had these phones and, that's right, and you just prayed someone had the same model phone as you so you could find a charger to plug it into. And this is, this is also a really good example of convergence of standards. Over time, there was a whole bunch of standards and it starts converging down to something that just becomes easy. I don't need to think about which cable to carry anymore. The education sector is more like this. So this is all the different charging plugs you can have for an EV car. So you know we're starting to see standardization with North America and Japan and Europe. We're starting to select a few different plugs in those regions. And then Tesla's still off doing its own thing. Now Tesla in the EU has been actually mandated. They have to use the EU plugs. So that's really nice. But what we don't want to be in the education sector is that Tesla over here, which no one else can connect to. We want to be in those standards with everyone else. And there's good reasons for this. So when you think about those standards from a vendor's point of view, so if we go back to the previous slide, why was it good for vendors? And in this case, we look at VHS versus beta, or if you look later, uh, HD DVDs versus Blu-ray. The big studios didn't want to have two standards, which meant they had to produce two versions of every movie with two different markets, and they had two lots of they had two lots of um, inventory to maintain, and they had two different lots of marking they had to do. For them, it's better, hey, there's a single standard, I produce a single thing, and then everyone can use it. And that's the same where we're starting to go with the education industry. We're actually working quite closely with Turnitin, so HQ's working quite closely with Turnitin right now, because they have three, ver sorry, Fiona, is there three versions of the plugin? Yep, so there's three versions of the Turnitin plugin to work with Moodle, because there's different versions, customers are on different platforms, to make everything work nicely, they have to maintain that. That's expensive for them. So it's much easier to, hey, if we can integrate through a standard, then they can build it once and it works with Moodle, it works with Canvas, it works with Blackboard, it works with D2L and the other thousand odd LMSs out there. So that then brings scalability to the platform. So that's from a vendor's point of view and our partner's point of view, it's important for them. But from our point of view, as an instructor, as an administrator, it means that if I use this tool and in Canvas and my institution goes, hey, we're actually gonna go move to Moodle now. I know it's gonna work. Uh, Marie talked about this yesterday and I think she may touch on it during her talk as well. One of the biggest inhibitors for our clients to, or for you guys to upgrade to a new Moodle version is actually plugins. So why do people not plug, upgrade for the first three to six months after a new release? Because they're waiting for the plugins to catch up. Now, if you're integrating to a standard, it will just work because as long as everything on this side and everything on that side can change, but if the interface doesn't change, then everything just continues to work. And that's critically important. So as a data point, about 60, we did a survey about this, about 60% of our respondents said the reason they don't upgrade immediately is because of plugins, waiting for the plugins that they're using to be upgraded. 
4%, and by comparison, 4% said it was change management. So just an interesting data point there. So in the education sector, what standards are out there and which ones are critical? So really, ones we're very familiar with is things like LTI. LTI exists in Moodle, but I will be a little bit unkind and say the current implementation is a little bit poor in comparison to the other LMSs. So we, we are, and I'll show you some of the work we've already started doing on that, we are starting to really concentrate on that and improve that. Calibre is a data standard as well. Sadly, it hasn't been taken up by the sector, but it's actually a really nice event-based standard where you can actually send events in and out. Very similar to XAPI in that respect, um, but it's another standard which we actually do have some support for. Um, XAPI, we have much stronger support for. But these are the ones we're talking about integration. So now I know if I integrate something using LTI, I can take it, I can plug it in, it is simple, I don't need to know anything technically, I follow a set of instructions and it just works. And that's the way it should be. LTI, uh, sorry, one uh, Tech, which used to be IMS Global, has also got a program called, about, called Trusted Apps. And that they do a bunch of assessments around the security and the information being passed to and from the tools. Um, they are pushing very, very hard with institutions to say, if your tools aren't part of this list, you should put this as part of your tender to make sure that you know, your vendors actually meet these standards. And that's where I was talking about that idea that technology, uh, the technology behind the security and the information should be there by default. Um, open format standards, so QTI and common cartridge. Part of our mission is to empower educators across the world, not just power Moodle educators across the world. So one of the things that I would like to see on our future roadmap would be better support for QTI, better support for common cartridge. The QTI is a quiz, quiz format, Common Cartridge is a course format. There are about a thousand tools that support QTI. There is maybe half a dozen that support the Moodle main native format. There is 4,800, I think it is, that support Common Cartridge. And that, like, if we do Common Cartridge well, that is one of those things that can actually make a tool like MoodleNet absolutely critical to the OER movement around the world. So I'm now exporting my course from Moodle to MoodleNet, and we've just done an integration there, and Matt's going to talk about that during his, his talk at 12 o'clock. It's in a common cartridge format. So we haven't done this yet, but this is my vision, which I'd love to do. We don't put it in a common cartridge format, and then anyone in the world can download that and use that in their LMS, because the vast majority of LMSs do support that. So then we're talking about that's being like, that's the OER sharing collaboration, and now I'm not restricted to only collaborating, collaborating with people with other Moodle instances, but anyone in the world I can actually help, help build content for and work with. Open credentialing standards, and this is actually a really interesting area. This is an area that there hasn't been as much convergen, convergence around the standards yet. So we have comprehensive learning record from the One Ed Tech. It's very North America focused at the moment, but it's the idea of having some sort of record that is in a standard format that can move between student management systems learning management systems. WC3, so the organization that looks after a lot of the web standards has a similar, a similar standard to, sorry, on this I should have actually had open badges as well. I seem to have deleted that for some reason, but open badges is the other um, standard that we have from One Ed Tech. Uh, verifiable credentials is a very similar one to the open badges, which is from uh, WC3, and that's actually starting to gain some traction as well. Um, not just a standard, but also a little bit more of a system as well is the Europass, and I'm using this as an example because there are several things like this happening around the world. The Europass is the idea that in parts of Europe, in the EU, what they want to be able to do is actually have a student get their credential from their organisation, put it in their personal wallet, and then when they apply for a job, they can share that credential with their employer or they apply for another course somewhere else, they can share that to that new educator, uh, education organisation. Europass is not the only ones happening like this. I believe there's something similar happening in Germany, there's something happening in the north of Europe. Uh, New South Wales government in Australia is actually doing this around building credentials. So there's a whole bunch of these. So I think over time that space is going to start to converge down to a smaller set of standards, but it's an actually really interesting one to look at. The last one there is actually open, open, HR Open Standards Organisation. So they're effectively the equivalent of the one ed techs in the HR and, and human resources world, so in the employment, employment side. 
they've recently agreed to use the comprehensive learning record as part of their resume, resume CV standard. So one of the big problems for them and their, their user base is student goes, does a course, they have all this information about what they learnt, they go apply for a job and none of the HR systems support that information so it just gets lost. It's lines on a, on a PDF within, a, within, a, um, within their resume itself. So by having these standards, we can start leveraging some of the things around automation, screening, you know, AI, although I personally have some, um, some concerns about that because of bias and those sort of things, but that's something we're discussing in our panel later on, on Thursday. But again, but having that standard to be able to connect those things makes those jobs a lot easier in the first place. So it actually opens up those possibilities. So how, how is Moodle HQ actually embracing those standards? Right now, in our 4.3 release, and that's a little bit easier to see, the first step we've done is actually we've gone into our course records um, and started doing, uh, sorry, into our course um, LTI tools and actually started making that tool a lot easier to configure at a course level. So one of the previous problems we have with Moodle, or the current version of Moodle, is as an instructor, I go to install an LTI tool. It doesn't look like I can do that at a course level. I have to do that at an instance level. Now, you can actually do it at a course level. It took me a long time to discover that. We didn't document it very well. But we're moving that out to a dedicated page, so it's easy for people to discover what tools are there. It's easy for them to configure. We're using progressive disclosure to actually make that much easier for them to go through. Um, this is a community contribution, and this is absolutely wonderful that this has come from the community. Um, this is being the ability to restrict LTI tools by category. So one of the big challenges has been for a long time, I want to install an LTI tool, but one faculty is using it. I'm installing Wirrus, for example, and only the mass faculty needs it. Nobody else cares. So how do I just, A, license it just for that faculty, and B, not clutter the interface for the other, you know, 60% or 50% of the institution that's not using that tool. So we've had some community con contributors who've actually worked on this, and then we've actually come up with a way that they can say, well, I've installed this tool at a system level, I can now only just show it to these categories, these departments, these faculties, which is you know, absolutely wonderful. So this is where we're starting to improve that experience and make, that, but make it easy to have those building blocks for the people who actually need them. Um, the other piece of work, so I'm really glad that Fiona's here from Turnitin and Martin as well. So we're working with them very closely. As I said earlier, they don't want to support three versions of the plugin because they want their customers to get access to the new tools quickly. They want it to be an easier onboarding experience and, they, and commercially for them it makes sense. So they've taken on the work to actually take that LTI mod and actually bring that into core. Now that's really valuable for us as a whole community. We're doing this in a really, in a, in a standards, a standards compliant way. So every, all the work that's being done will be, um, leave, can be leveraged by everyone in this room. That's the first step. The second step will be additional placements within, LT, within the LTI, within the UI. So right now, within um, Moodle, you can have an LTI tool as an activity and that's it. If you look at, our, if you look at some of the other LMSs, you can have an LTI tool appear on the course navigation, you can have it appear on the global navigation, you can have it appear in the grade book, you can have it appear as an assignment, you can have it appear a whole bunch of different places. So over time, we'll be adding these placements into Moodle. So that will allow us to start doing things like, I have a teacher tool that I only want to show them in the secondary navigation within the course. Um, the third thing is we've done is the open badges. So open badges three standards just is very close to being ratified. We've done the assessment of the amount of work. Um, the MOPI team sitting down the back there, they actually did a lot, a lot of the assessment of how much effort that would be. And we're looking at scheduling that sometime early next year. That's quite a big piece of work. So. It's, lo it's lower on the priority list because open badges are not actually Im implemented by any vendors yet. So, but we want to be early in there and we want to be one of the leaders and actually have that as something we can say, hey, we are actually leading this movement. We're not waiting for everyone else to catch up with us. Um, in the ideas, so this is, if you look at our roadmap in the later and later still, and these are just very, very early ideas, we have implemented support for QTI, common cartridge and thin common cartridge. So as I said, my ideal world would be we build these things, we have them working, sorry, that's my timer, so I'm right on time. Um, we have these things that we build that we can then start exporting to Moodle.net. We can start collaborating with other institutions who aren't on Moodle. 
and maybe, hey, we, they, they see the quality of stuff coming from us and convince them that it might be something we want to look at. So really this gets back to our core mission. So how do all these things enable our core mission? Unlocking that creativity. So we now can do that collaboration between the, um, facilitating, that, um, facilitating that collaboration, unlocking that creativity so people can try tools out, they can use things quickly, they can install them without having to do a massive huge assessment or upgrades and all sorts of other things. And all of those together start optimizing the outcomes for our students, for our teachers, and for our institution. So that's pretty much the end of my talk. And thank you very much for listening, everyone. Do we have any questions? So we've got about two or three minutes. So I'll probably take one, maybe two questions, depending on how long they are. We've got one over the corner here. Ron. <laughs> So hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, at the beginning, you briefly mentioned the QTI uh, challenge, uh, and I was wondering uh, how would you handle um, standards that are too open to interpretation? Uh, we know that QTI has various interpretations uh, that would prevent integrating into a system. Uh, where vendors say they support QTI, but they have their own model of QTI. So QTI as a standard is actually quite well defined. So QTI 2 and 2.1 are actually very well defined. What you're probably talking about there is there's a lot of, inst uh, a lot of systems that have extensions to QTI. So if we, if we implement the base as a start, then we could be looking at, so okay, maybe we do want to, we get a lot of content coming from various different uh, other LMSs. So one of those might be you know, Canvas, for example. I know it's a challenge for our partners when they want to migrate someone from Canvas, Blackboard, or D12 to take their content across. So that's where we can start prioritizing. Maybe it is worth us implementing their extensions. Um, it's not an easy question, but the standard itself is well defined. It's the extensions that become a problem. Sorry. Um, Tim? Sorry, it's probably a lot. Um, I would dispute that QTI is well defined, um, or at least it's certainly not an interchange format. I think it's about as so back in about 2008, we had a good look at QTI because obviously it seemed like the only standard in town, so Moodle ought to support it. And it's effectively not supportable in Moodle. It's a bit like saying that word format would be a good interchange format for text, structured text documents. It's not, it's its own thing. So the other thing I would say just empirically, a question import export plugin is one of the simplest and most self-contained sorts of plugins you could create for Moodle. Yep. So, and I just note that in the last 15 years, no one's actually created one. So that makes me a little skeptical how much value there actually is. So, I, and I don't disagree with you, Tim. QTI does have some challenges to implement Moodle. Yeah. That's no doubt. But it's come a long way since 2008. There's been two revisions on the standard. Um, people haven't had a need to share these yeah. things. And we, as HQ, part of our driver is not looking at just like, your institution has a need, so it doesn't have a need for common cartridge, so they're not going to do that. No. We look at the larger organisation, the larger institutions, the sector as a whole on how we can benefit everyone. So while as an individual institution you may not have a need, our partners definitely have a need for these formats. We definitely have our vendors and like our integration partners have a need for these formats. And as part of the larger OER well, movement. What I'm saying is if I, I mean... If a partner's, if multiple partners have had a need for a QTI import format, why hasn't one of them built it? That's a very good question. That's, I find, anyway, yeah. but I mean the other, you know, other standards. LTI is just a fantastic standard. We yeah. use that a lot, and I know people out there who use LTI because they're stuck with a different institutional VLE and they want Moodle quiz and some of its question types. Yeah, exactly. So they run their own Moodle site and LTI it into their other VLE. So that's yeah. that's a pattern. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So, fortunately, we are out of time because the next speaker needs to jump up and start. But thank you very much for your attention, everyone. And I, if anyone has any questions, please come and see me. I'll be around for the next three days. So.